Hi, thanks Hi, for joining us for today's Google Press Hangout. Hangout. I'm Nicole, Nicole Cuvier Masters for Johnson Space Center Public, Public Affairs. Affairs. And today, I think the entire Space Agency is a buzz with the news that we've selected eight new individuals as our astronaut candidates. So while we would have loved for them to have been a part of the Hangout today, um, as you can imagine, this has been dramatic news for them as well. So they are busy sharing this news with their friends and family and likely their employers as well and making some adjustments and transitions there. So we'll continue to keep you posted on their progress as they near for their arrival here in Houston. But in the meantime, we have four people with us who have been in their shoes. So joining us here at the Johnson Space Center studio are uh, two veteran astronauts, Dr. Ellen Ochoa, who is a veteran of four space flights and is now the director for Johnson Space Center, and also Dr. Janet Cavandi, who likewise is a veteran of three space flights and now is the director for flight crew operations. Also joining us uh, elsewhere here at the JSC is astronauts Mike Foreman and Kate Rubin. So we'll be talking to them a little bit later. Um, but for now, let's uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Ochoa to tell us a little bit about what this, is, uh, what this means for Johnson Space Center. Well, it's an exciting day for NASA, and particularly here at Johnson Space Center, which is the home of the astronaut corps and of mission control. Um, we work with a team all across NASA, a really talented team who help advance space exploration. And astronauts are often the most public face of that. And so in addition to looking for people who have the technical and the operations expertise to carry out activities in space, we also ask those people to really represent the whole team, to be NASA's ambassadors. And uh, I think when you hear a little bit more about the people that we've selected, you'll see that not only do they have uh, you know, the incredible talent and some really interesting experiences, but they have a real passion for the job, and, and we think they'll be wonderful ambassadors for us. Uh, it definitely does take me back, um, actually not even only to when I was selected, to, but really to the day I first stepped foot uh, on Johnson Space Center, which was a few years before that when I first came to interview for the astronaut corps. And I can remember just being here thinking, wow, this is like hallowed ground. It's, you know, it's just a special place to be. And when I was selected, um, it was so exciting to think I was joining the talented team here. And we have continued to make really difficult things happen in space over the years that I've been here. Uh, we're doing amazing things on board the International Space Station right now, and we're involved in developing the systems, the technologies, and the plans for exploring beyond low Earth orbit. So we're really excited to welcome eight new people to this enterprise. Thanks, Ellen. And there with you is Janet, who, as the chair of the Astronaut Selection Board, at this point probably knows these people as good as anybody. Janet, why don't you just go ahead and take a moment to, to introduce, introduce us to this class and tell us a little bit about them. Yeah, we're really, really proud of, of this class and we're really excited to bring them here. I think when you hear about them just a little bit and as I go over each one, I think you'll get a sense of the type of quality of individuals that we've selected. So let's go ahead and I'll show you a few pictures of these individuals as I tell you a little bit about them. So first up, we have Dr. Josh Casada. He's a civilian, uh, former Navy pilot. Uh, he was born in San Diego, California, but considers White Bear Lake, Minnesota, his hometown. He's currently living in Michigan. His education, he has a uh, physics degree, a bachelor of physics from Albion College, a master's in physics from the University of Rochester, and a PhD in physics from the University of Rochester. And his uh, thesis was about subatomic particles, specifically top quarks and anti-top quarks. Um, he, and in the Navy, he was um, a test, he attended test pilot school. Uh, he flew T P3s, P8s, and he was a P38N, T3, T6 instructor pilot. Uh, he was chief of flight operations for P8 uh, acceptance at uh, the U for the U.S. Navy for the Defense Contract Management Agency in Seattle. And he uh, is currently Chief Technology Officer for a startup company called Quantum Opus. And he just recently did that in April of 2013. So he's going undergoing some changes in multiple ways. Um, he went in the Navy. He was uh, part of 23 combat missions. He also were, received a humanitarian award for relief work in Sumatra. Um, he enjoys scuba diving, running, and skiing. He's got over 2,400 2, hours of flying. 
Okay, we'll move on to the next candidate. Uh, this is Lieutenant Commander Victor J. Glover. He was born in Pomona, California, considers Prosper, Texas, his hometown, currently lives in Washington, D.C. He received a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from the California Polytechnic State University, a Master's in Flight Test en Engineering from the Air University, a Master's in Systems Engineering from Na Naval Postgraduate School, and a Master's in Military and Operational Arts and Sciences from the Air University. He was a combat pilot in Strike, uh, strike Fighter Squadron 3-4. He also attended U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School. He was an F-18 Test Pilot and Project Officer and Department Head at the Strike Fighter Squadron in Japan. Currently, he's a continuing U.S. Naval Officer and a Legislative Fellow for the United States Congress. He flew 24 combat missions. He's a scuba diver and he enjoys education and outreach. He has over 2,000 hours of flying experience. Next, we have Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Air Force, Nick Haig. He was born in Belleville, Belleville, Kansas, but considers Hoxie, Kansas his hometown. He currently lives in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, Nick received a bachelor's degree in aerospace aeronautical engineering from the U.S. Air Force Academy and a master's degree in aeronautics and aeronautics at MIT. He, uh, worked, he also was a test pilot grad for the Air Force, director of operations at the Air Expeditionary Wing, is F-15 and F-16 flight test engineer, and also a T-38 pilot. Uh, he was also a U.S. Air Force legislative fellow and a congressional liaison. Currently, he's the R&D Deputy Chief at the Joint Improvised Explosive Device and Defeat Organization. He's got 139 combat missions. He's a scuba dive master and a private pilot. It's 523 hours of flight time. Moving on, Christina Hammock, civilian, born in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the hometown of Jacksonville, North Carolina. Uh, her education, she received a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, a second bachelor's degree in physics, and a master's degree in electrical engineering from North Carolina State University. She was an electrical engineer, uh, worked on x-ray uh, detection at NASA Goddard. She also was an electrical engineer at John Hopkins Applied Research Lab, uh, excuse me, Applied Physics Lab. She was a research associate for cryogenics techni uh, and technician, cryogenics technician for Raytheon, and a science technician, Polar Field Services Company. She did two winter seasons in Greenland, and she did uh, a season in Antarctica as part of her research. She's a scuba diver, a rock climber, and an ice climber. Nicole Mann is a major in the Marine Corps. She was born in Petaluma, California, considers Pengrove, California, her hometown. She has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy and a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford. She was an F-18, or currently is an F-18 pilot for the Marine Corps. She served in Iraq. Uh, she went to U.S. Navy Test Pilot School, and she's currently an F-18 test pilot and operations officer and integrated product team lead at Patuxent River. She's also a scuba diver. She was a Naval Academy soccer team captain, and she is interested in and has participated in triathlons and backcountry camping. She has over 1,400 hours of flight time. Anne McLean is a major in the U.S. Army. She was born and considers her hometown Spokane, Washington. She has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from uh, West Point and an MS, or I'm sorry, a master's in public health from the University of Bath and a master's degree in international security from the University of Bristol. She is a rotary wing pilot and command squadron intelligence officer from maintenance detachment commander and maintenance detachment commander. Uh, she served in Iraqi Freedom she had 230 combat missions. Uh, 
she's also a rotary, rotary wing instructor pilot and operations officer. Um, she flies OH-58 Delta Kiowa Warriors, and she just recently, as of last Friday, graduated from test pilot school, the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School. Uh, she also has been selected and uh, played on the U.S. Uh, women's national rugby team. She's also a scuba uh, open water diver and has her commercial rating. She has over 1,600 hours of flight time. Next we have Dr. Jessica Muir. She was born in Caribou, Maine and considers that her hometown. Her education is a BA in biology from Brown University, a master's degree in space studies from the International Space University, and a PhD in marine biology from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She's got a broad uh, work experience, including uh, field work in Antarctica. She's done four field deployments of two and a half months each at Penguin Ranch, where she studied penguins, did research on them in Antarctica. She's also a technical scuba diver. She's done ice diving, and she's done principal investigation project management at the University of British Columbia, where she studied bar-headed geese. She also has experience in uh, Mongolia. She's currently assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and the Massachusetts General Hospital. She's also a scuba diver, an under ice diver, a flautist, and a private pilot, instrument rated pilot. She's got 180 hours of flying time. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Andrew Morgan. He goes by Drew. He's a major in the U.S. Army. He was born in Morgantown, West Virginia, considers Newcastle, Pennsylvania his hometown. Currently lives in, in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. He has his bachelor's degree in environmental engineering from West Point and his doctorate degree, MD, in, from the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. He, um, was a staff emergency physician at Wilmot Army Medical Center, operational medical officer at the Joint Special Operations Command. He's been deployed to Iraq, to Afghanistan, and to Africa. He was also a team physician for the Golden Knights, and he also jumped with the Golden Knights and has about 380 hour uh, parachute jumps. He is currently med medical element of, uh, commander, senior medical officer, um, and is uh, on his way to move down here with, uh, with us. He attended the Army Ranger School, also a scuba diver and a rescue diver, and has run the U.S. Marine Corps Marathon and participated in ultra marathons. He has 356 hours of flight time. So as you can tell, it's quite an amazing uh, group of people we selected with uh, you know, a smaller astronaut corps, uh, fewer people in the office now. Each person needs to have as diverse a background as possible. So uh, we tried to work hard to make sure that eight people we got had a broad spectrum of experiences. And I think you can tell that from, from their qualifications. Thanks, Janet. Absolutely. It definitely, like you said, crosses the broad spectrum. I think almost every area of expertise seems covered there. Well, we have a, a next um, video, which is some special words from NASA Administrator Charles Bolden congratulating uh, this selection. So we'll roll that next. Hello, I'm NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden, and I'm excited to be a part of this Google Plus Hangout, where you'll learn more about the 21st class of NASA astronauts. We're very proud of this select group and look forward to helping you get to know them. The astronaut candidates of 2013 come from the second largest pool of applications we've ever received, more than 6,300. These new space explorers asked to join NASA because they know we're doing big, bold things here, developing missions to go farther than ever before. They're excited about the science we're doing on the International Space Station and our plan to launch from U.S. soil on spacecraft built by American companies. And they're ready to help lead the first human mission to an asteroid, and then on to Mars. To these new members of the NASA family, I offer my heartiest congratulations and welcome each of you on behalf of the nation's space program. 
I'm personally awed by your individual achievements, and we're all inspired by your commitment to exploration and taking America to new heights in space. I remember when I got the call that I had been selected for the astronaut corps. It was a once-in-a-lifetime feeling. I know all of our new astronauts will make us proud and lead us to new frontiers. They're very important to our future, and believe me, the best is yet to come. Okay, so um, even in that video, Holden uh, acknowledged that we had more than 6,300 applicants for this class. So, Janet, why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about how does the selection board even approach something like that when you have so few spots but so many qualified applicants? Yeah, it's quite a tremendous uh, undertaking. Uh, we start out, like you said, advertising to a broad range of, of individuals all across America. Um, we went through the 6,300 applications individually, one by one, and uh, we had people with like, hands uh, and eyes on each individual application. The daunting test was to try to get from that 6,300 down to 120 people that we wanted to bring in and interview personally. But we were able to achieve that over a few months, and we selected 120 people to bring to the Johnson Space Center, where they underwent some initial medical evaluations and a one-hour uh, interview process with a select a selection board um, and once we did that uh, we got some uh, eliminations through the medical process and we brought back our top 50 candidates who we believe demonstrated the most potential for succeeding in this career um, of those uh, actually we, we brought back 49 not quite 50 we brought back 49 individuals and those 49 individuals underwent a vast array of medical evaluations and tests, psychological evaluations, they did language aptitude uh, evaluations, they did mechanical skills evaluations, and had another uh, hour-long interview with the selection board. And after undergoing all that grueling process, we came out with the eight most qualified people that we feel have the best chance of passing all the re you know, rigorous requirements of becoming an astronaut. It's, it looks like a great class, and I'm, I'm sure it was really start, uh, really difficult, that whole process. Um, next, we want to go ahead and start by taking some questions. We've gotten some reporters who've called in, so we'll start by um, taking questions from Bill Harward with CBS. Hey, thank you very much. Jack, can you refresh my memory on what the current size of the astronaut corps is before these eight uh, join? Thanks. Yeah, we have about 48 active astronauts in the Corps today, um, and uh, those people have been leaving, you know, at a peak we were at 150 people about a decade ago. After the end of the, uh, re or the retirement of the shuttle program, we reduced down to about 50, and uh, we had an NRC uh, commission that came in and looked at our office and determined that a 45 to 55 person range was appropriate for the missions that we do today, considering uh, attrition and medical disqualifications and, and other types of disqualifications that people may uh, run into as they uh, train for missions. So this 45 to 55 seems to be the appropriate size of the office, so that's what we're trying to maintain right now. Okay, next we'll take a question from Mark Corot with Aviation Week. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, were you ready for me? I thought I heard a follow-up from Bill Harwood. Sorry, we're just Sorry, doing the so can... okay. Yeah, I had a follow-up if there's time. If there's not, that's okay. Okay, Bill, go ahead with your follow-up. Thanks. Um, can you give us a sense of, uh, you know, the, the timing of this with these eight candidates? And, of course, the news release talks about Mars and, you know, asteroids and things like that. Um, I'm assuming these guys, when they finish their training period and are, are qualified astronauts, would be around and ready to fly anyway when, when a commercial vehicle presumably would come online or, or you know, the SLS system comes online later. Could you just talk about the mission these guys potentially could fly? That's it for me. Thanks. Okay. You want to take that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, we do have a lot of things that are either going on right now or are coming in the future. And of course, the uh, the main operational program that we're supporting is the International Space Station, and we have um, one or two NASA astronauts on board at all times. Um, and we're right now we're going to be operating it at least through 2020. And when you look at all the things we really need to understand about human space exploration, 
uh, we really like to operate it longer in order to get a lot of the information, particularly about human body and human systems and life support systems that we'll need to uh, explore beyond low Earth orbit. So certainly supporting the International Space Station. And as you know, we are uh, in the midst of working with commercial companies to develop a commercial crew transportation system. Uh, we're hoping that later this decade, maybe around 2017, um, that that first system might be available. And so certainly this is something that crew could look forward to. We're also developing the Orion multipurpose crew vehicle, and that's designed specifically to go beyond low Earth orbit. And um, the Marshall Space Flight Center is developing the uh, space launch system, the rocket that will launch it. And so we do plan to have missions that will start to demonstrate the capability to live beyond low Earth orbit um, and be able to take us eventually to go to Mars. And so we do expect that class to be involved uh, both in the development and, and flying on Orion as well. Okay, now we'll now switch, we'll switch back, back to you, Mark Corot, again with Aviation Week. Thank you very much. Um, could you talk a little bit, um, as best you know, uh, about your plans for future recruiting and hiring? Um, also, in connection with that, I'd like your thoughts on the tremendous number of people who applied for just a few openings, really. Um, and again, I, I share your observation how talented they are. Do you think you'll have trouble in the future getting as many people to apply uh, with the kinds of qualifications and background that you got this time. Thank you. Well, Mark, I think uh, we were extremely pleased to see that so many people still had such an incredible interest in the space program and, and being a part of it as far as flying uh, on whatever vehicles that we will come up with in the future, commercial and SLS and Orion and all uh, future potential missions. So I don't see any of that enthusiasm decreasing at all. So I'm really not worried at all about the quantities of people that are interested and want to apply. And as you've seen and heard all the qualifications that we had in, in these eight in individuals, there are some people out there that have done just incredible and amazing things with their careers so far in a short number of years. So we want to take full advantage of those people and uh, bring them here to NASA and apply that expertise and education uh, to help us make human spaceflight go even further than it ever has before. Uh, I, as far as when we might select again, we're not real sure. We, we used to select every two to three years, and I think it all depends on the attrition rate of the current of the size of the office. Like I said, we want to try to maintain a 45 to 55 uh, person range. So as we de deem necessary, we'll advertise again in the future, I would guess two to four years from now, and then we'll go out with another announcement at that point and start the process again. Okay, okay with that, we're going to take a quick, quick break for questions. questions. And as we mentioned, we weren't able to have the candidates themselves participate in this Hangout, but they were able to send us some short videos, um, a little bit of a few remarks in their words on this great achievement. Hi, I'm Josh Cassidy, 2013 astronaut candidate. I'm really excited about uh, being a part of something that's much bigger than me um, and working alongside some of the, the world's best minds who, who thankfully for us uh, feel the same about being part of something much bigger than them. You know, from my perspective, exploration is the foundation of, uh, of the human spirit. Um, and whether that exploration is, you know, at the subatomic level or on the nanoscale or even the, the cosmic scale. Um, you know, I think if, if society isn't exploring, we're really just kind of sustaining. And uh, to, to be able to contribute to that, contribute to that and that exploration in any small way is uh, really exciting to me. I'm Lieutenant Commander Victor Glover, and I'm a 2013 NASA astronaut candidate. The thing that really draws me and, and excites me about the future is the opportunity to be a part of kindling America's passion for aerospace and space. I think there's something special about flying and, and, and especially flying in space that it just draws people's fascination and passions. And being a part of that is the thing that I think excites me the most. The first person that I told was my wife. Uh, as soon as I got off the phone with Janet, 
and pinched myself a couple of times. I called my wife. Uh, we are actually in the process of uh, negotiating orders, so I'm in the process of working with the Navy to determine where I would go next uh, if the astronaut program didn't work out. And so my wife is very aware, and she's very keen to find out where we're going next. And so I called her, and, and I was able to tell her that now we know where we're going. We're moving to Houston, and she was ecstatic. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Nick Haig, 2013 NASA astronaut candidate. My parents are going to be excited. They know that this has been a lifelong goal, uh, trying to become part of the program. Uh, my brothers, uh, as they always do, will give me a hard time and uh, you know tell me the uh, the challenges ahead of the training program. Uh, but um, everybody's going to be excited. I've wanted to become an astronaut for a, for a long time. Uh, this is my third third attempt at, a, at applying, and uh, it, what really solidified my interest in getting involved with the uh, the space program uh, was when I got involved with flight tests out at uh, Edwards Air Force Base, going through test pilot school. Uh, the idea of uh, getting to uh, discover new things, uh, test out very complicated systems is something that uh, I gravitated towards. Hi, I'm Christina Hammock and I'm a 2013 astronaut candidate. But what actually inspired me to make the, the move to, to actually do the application was just reflecting on my career and realizing that through following my own personal dreams, I had accumulated a set of skills that I thought could really be useful in contributing to human spaceflight. The big picture is that I really look forward to being able to directly contribute to the human spaceflight program. I really strongly believe in both the practical aspects of the research being conducted, as well as the larger picture of the human spaceflight program um, bringing us forward um, as a human race and uniting us in exploring the universe. Hi, I'm Major Nicole Mann, United States Marine Corps, NASA 2013 astronaut candidate. The uh, astronaut selection announcement came out uh, in January of last year. I, I couldn't believe it. I was you know, incredibly excited and I kind of took a look at my career and, and I had met all those uh, benchmarks or those requirements. And so I figured, well, I'll put my name in the hat. Um, you, know, I you know, I thought it was a long shot because they don't select you know, very many people. I'm really looking forward to the people down at NASA and, uh, and working for that great organization. I've had the opportunity to go down a couple times to a visit and really it's just the, uh, the energy and the excitement, the um, professionals down there and our international partners, everybody you know, working uh, towards a common mission towards science exploration. Um, and really that big goal of, of all of humankind. So I'm looking forward to being a part of that uh, very important team. Hi, I am Major Ann McLean, NASA 2013 astronaut candidate. I have been as excited to tell my mother that I was selected as I was to be selected myself. Um, so I called her and I, I, the first thing I said, and I asked her what she was doing and she was out in the front uh, gardening her roses. And I said, uh, well, you'll never forget this moment. And I said, I've been selected as an astronaut candidate. And she screamed, she screamed so loud that my stepfather ran out of the house. I think he, he thought that she had injured herself. Uh, it was certainly exciting. She, uh, she, had the, she sounded like she had the same reaction that I did. I've been blessed with amazing opportunities and amazing people that have helped me along the way. I've been humbled by the amount of, uh, by how much I've had to rely on everybody else um, to kind of get to the point that I'm at. Um, I truly don't remember being, when I ever wanted to be something else, and it's just so surreal that uh, this moment's arrived. Hello, my name is Dr. Jessica Meir, and I'm a 2013 astronaut candidate. Well, of course, what I'm looking forward to most, uh, the big one would be eventually, hopefully, flying in space, since that has been my dream since I was about five years old. Uh, but I'm also really excited about becoming part of the NASA team again. Astronauts are, of course, fortunate enough to, be the, to often be the face of NASA uh, and to actually fly the missions, but of course it takes a whole group of, of individuals to make those missions happen. I'm also looking forward to various aspects of the training itself. I have my private pilot's license, but I'm really excited about going to Pensacola for real flight training in jets. That's something that'll be really, really uh, incredible for me. 
And I'm also really looking forward to the international component. I really enjoy studying foreign languages and cultures. And so the immersion in the Russian culture and society that we'll have as part of the International Space Station and the other, uh, the other international partners as well. I'm really looking forward to that. Hi, my name is Andrew Morgan. I'm a major in the United States Army and I'm a 2013 NASA astronaut candidate. I definitely felt drawn to being surrounded by the people that I had been, um, encountered at NASA and being part of the astronaut office, being part of the, um, the astronaut corps was uh, they're just a, an incredibly talented group of people and to be a part of that, uh, it just I, I knew that that would be something special. Uh, without a doubt, the, I'm really looking forward to meeting my classmates. Uh, that's uh, kind of my my near-term goal right now is to get to know them right away. We've we've had some uh, sporadic initial contact here by email, and about, I know about half of them from the interview process. But I'm really uh, eager to get together with them and to meet the other half um, because we really want to build uh, um, build that atmosphere of an extended family early on. And so the, the sooner the better. I really can't wait to meet them. Okay, so that's some words um, directly from the astronaut candidates themselves, as you heard there. Um, the excitement just to be arriving here in Houston and uh, looking forward to starting their work with the space agency. And it's hard for some of us to imagine what that must be like when you've um, are finally realizing a dream that it's something maybe you've worked on your whole life or your whole career has been dedicated to pursuing. So this is really exciting and um, for all of you, but especially um, Mike and Kate, I want to turn it over to you. This must be bringing back a lot of memories for you as well. I think, Mike, you were selected back in 1998 and you've since flown uh, two space shuttle missions. And Kate, you were actually selected in our most recent astronaut class. Um, can you both tell us a little bit about what it was like and take us back to when you got the call? Well, Nicole, first let me say I'm just glad that I'm not competing for an astronaut slot today. You know, the incredible individuals that they've selected are just uh, far and away. They, they seem like superhuman people to me, you know, I, and so I'm glad that uh, after applying for about eight times, uh, I was selected in 1998. And uh, so I, I always thought, you know, my career would be just applying to be an astronaut. I, I was hopeful, but but not very uh, uh, sure that I would ever get selected. So after uh, many rejections, uh, actually making it down here was just the thrill of life. You know, you, you can hear it in their voices when they're talking about getting that call. It's just so thrilling. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit envious of them to be, you know, at the starting point again, because those were some great times, you know, with um, me and my classmates coming together in uh, 1998 and, uh, going through the initial training, just, just a thrill. But uh, Kate, you probably have some thoughts. Yeah, so when you when you uh, are going through the interview process, you meet all these incredible folks, and so you're about 99.5% sure that you're never going to get the call. And, and so it's actually a little bit relaxing because you figure everybody else is so fantastic, they're never going to take you. So there's that 0.5% that says, hey, what if this actually happens? You know, how am I going to figure out my whole life? And so it, it's incredibly exciting um, to be notified that you've been selected, but uh, then there's also this kind of overwhelming feeling of everybody's got a career and a life and, and something that they're very, very passionate about what they've been doing to this point. So you have to wrap that up in short order and get down to Houston and start a, an entirely new adventure, one that's incredibly exciting. I think that's another part that's kind of interesting to this is, is just, a, like you said, the transition that's happening now. Tell us what that was like and maybe, Kate, especially you since you did it more recently, what does that all entail and how, you know, were you given a lot of help, or how did you even go about a relocation like that in short time frame? Because I think they're starting here literally on August 1st or thereafter, so um, they don't have a whole lot of time to make that swap. There's not a lot of time, but at the same time, uh, you're you're really excited to jump in and start your training. And there's so many aspects of the training that, that are so exciting. You want this to be six months out. You got to you got to wrap step up, and you got to move down to Houston. So there's obviously you know, the, the logistics of getting here, and NASA's really good about helping folks out. I think the biggest thing is to make sure um, whatever they were doing in their previous career, you know, if they're military, if they're in a squadron, um, if they're at a university, make sure all that, that stuff is tied up. And for me, um, I was running a research lab at MIT, and so I, I had a whole bunch of people that were working for me. So it was really important to me to make sure that they all had good jobs, that the, the research could continue, 
Um, they went to other universities. Um, we had to move the grant funding along. So these are processes that can take months or years when a principal investigator changes institution. And we had about six weeks to get it all done. And uh, luckily, folks landed in a good place. So um, they're focused right now on, on wrapping up the lives that they're currently leading. And uh, as you move into getting ready to come to Houston, they'll start looking forward to all the training that they're going to do here. Gotcha. We want to go ahead and t start taking some questions, um, folks, by social media and um, people watching. We still want to encourage you to submit questions using the hashtag AskNASA. So one of the first questions we got was from at Women in the Air, and their question was, was it a deliberate decision to have half of the 13 astronaut class be women, or was it by happenstance? And maybe, um, Janet, that might be a question better for you since you were on the board. Yeah, that that was not by choice or by you know, determination. We never determined how many people of each gender we're going to take, uh, but these were the most qualified people of the ones that we interviewed. Um, they earned every bit of the right to be there. It turned out that they happened to be half men and half women in the end, uh, which I think is a great tribute to uh, women today. They've achieved and are going into fields that are much more demanding and make them on equal footing as, as the male candidates. So in the end, when we selected uh, all the women candidates, as you heard, have tremendous qualifications and certainly earned the right to be there. So uh, I'm, I'm glad, I'm happy that it turned out that way, but we didn't intentionally go out seeking that when we started out. Okay, and one other question we've gotten by uh, via Twitter um, from at Project Did you know, What are the physical qualities required to get selected as an astronaut? physical qualifications. Uh, well, there are many physical qualifications. I'm not a medical doctor, so, and I did not do the medical screening. So there's those, those types of medical qualifications, which are physical. And then there's uh, a certain amount of anthropometric physical qualifications and limitations. We're limited by the, the size of the spacecraft and the size of the space suits. So that's also sort of a, a physical limitation. We didn't actually do any uh, sort of endurance testing or anything like that, but by virtue of these people's careers you can, and what they've done, we uh, know that they're in very good shape just because of you can't really do what these people do and not be in really good physical shape. A lot of them run marathons and, and things like that in addition to, to their careers. So they're just very nice special, uh, physical specimens as well as uh, their academic skills are just unparalleled. Great. Um, just taking a break from the questions, the word of this exciting announcement has traveled far and fast, and we actually have a special message from the astronauts who are actually working on the International Space Station now. This was a message that was recorded uh, by Chris Cassidy and Karen Nyberg up on the space station. 2013 ASCANS, welcome to the astronaut office. I'm Chris Cassidy and... And I'm Karen Nyberg. We're here up here on the International Space Station, and we're very excited to be able to welcome you aboard. And uh, we were thinking back to when we got the initial calls ourselves, so we thought it'd be fun to, to share our thoughts about where were we and who we called and the whole our experience with this particular exciting day. For me, I had just gotten back from a, a military six-month deployment, kind of like this trip here to the space station, literally that weekend. And I had gotten a message to call the astronaut office on, on Monday and uh, and at noon for I think it was and just a handful of minutes before the time I was supposed to call there the phone rang in our house and uh, it was Kent Rominger who was the chief astronaut at the time he said Chris uh, just wondering if you're still interested in working for us and uh, I was so excited and my wife and three small kids at the time were there and my kids were excited I think not because they understood what was going on but because they saw me and my wife very happy and excited and uh, so that was my first experience. So my family was the first people that found out, my wife and three kids. And then uh, we had to kind of keep it a secret for a while, but I did tell my mom and dad and brother right away. Gosh, it was almost 13 years ago now, and I was working as an engineer at the Johnson Space Center. And I remember I was sitting at my desk in Building 7, and I got the call from Charlie Precourt. And again, the same thing. He asked, just wondering if you're still interested in coming to work for us. and and uh, I didn't really know what to do with myself. We were also told to, to keep it quiet, and so I didn't want to 
uh, screen too much or go around telling everybody at work because, you know, being at the Johnson Space Center and I was afraid of, of get letting it out when I wasn't supposed to. So I went home. It was around lunchtime and I went home and I don't think I went back to work that day. I was just too excited. <laughs> So that's our, our stories and probably very similar to yours. The, the, the excitement that you feel that day is just hard to, to describe to anybody. But we know what you're going through, so congratulations. It's really exciting. Um, just kind of thinking about what I would have liked to know in this period of time from you, from this phone call until you show up, uh, and then in your first few, first few weeks or months here at, at the Space Center, uh, really nothing. It's a great place to work. It's a really family-oriented place to work. Um, take care of all your personal things right now. Make sure you you uh, got your your house, your family, your all this type of stuff in order to make the transition to Houston if you're not already living here uh, because you're going to be busy in the next year. So you want to take this time from now. It'll happen fast, but this next month or so, a couple months to to get your plan ready to go and then uh, and have a smooth transition um, so you're ready to work and be and learn all the things you need to learn uh, to come up here and join us on the space station. Oh, Karen, what do you think? Well, I was actually living in Houston when it happened, so I didn't have to do all the, the moving, but um, just hearing from my classmates, I know you guys are going to be going through a lot, getting, getting uh, your families uprooted and coming to Houston, but um, just know that this, the astronaut office is a big family and there are lots of people to help you, so if you uh, need to reach out to somebody to help you as you're moving into town, I'm sure there are plenty of people. Um, I'm willing to help out in November when I get back. And... It probably seems like a long ways away when they scare you and tell you how, how long it's going to be until you fly in space, but trust us, it is so worth it. Right now, it's, we're having just a great time floating around and uh, uh, getting to be here on the space station, looking out the window, looking at our uh, uh, sharing meals with our Russian cosmonaut crewmates. It's just, it's just a blast. So all the training, all the hard work uh, is worth it. And like we said, it's a fantastic place to work at NASA. So welcome to the NASA family, the astronaut office family, uh, to you and your families. We're really ha happy to have you here. Welcome aboard. Okay, that again, some special words from the on-orbit crew, two of our crewmates that are living there and working um, on the International Space Station. I think we probably all want to apply after watching that. Um, very exciting. So we're going to switch back now to the phone bridge with some more questions from some of the media representatives who've likewise been interested in this. Um, we'll start with Pete Spots with the Christian Science Monitor. Well, thank you very much, and I think this may be for, uh, for Janet. Um, lots of scuba experience here, um, no small amount of experience in isolated places for fairly long periods of time. I wonder if you could just kind of go over a bit of uh, how the needs of the astronaut corps have changed over the years. Um, and I also noticed a fair bit of test pilot experience. I wonder if this is kind of a bit like the, uh, in a sense, like the days back, you know, Mercury and Gemini and so forth, where there was active uh, capsule development going on, and so there might be a higher, a slightly higher premium on those skill sets than there might have been, you know, five, ten years ago or so. Well, yeah, you're right. There, some of that is true. Uh, part of it is what I mentioned earlier. We have just four Americans flying to, to the International Space Station per year right now. So when we have smaller classes, each individual really needs to have a, a huge amount of skill set they can bring forward. Just we don't have the luxury of taking too many people, so each person is just actually chock full of talent. Um, so yeah, they the people that we've looked at and the people that tend to be the most successful are people that have shown a lot of experience in remote operations, who are very hands-on type people who are familiar with tools and operations with tools, uh, who are comfortable in different uh, cultures and different countries. And as you, as you saw in these candidates, if they weren't military, who by default get a lot of hands-on operations in all parts of the world, then they are research scientists who have also deployed to remote environments. Um, they're used to not being comfortable. They, they work in some pretty extreme environments like space, only not quite space, 
uh, but it's it's just easier transition for people when they've experienced those kinds of hardships and, and uncomfortable physical environments and have a, had a lot of hands-on uh, experience. They just tend to do a lot better, and that's what we've learned over all these decades of, of human space flight is the type of people that seem to work best, and those are the type of people that we're seeking out now. Okay, and we want to switch to Lisa Grossman with New Scientist. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I was wondering if we don't know precisely when or where the astronauts are going. Um, I saw that there's a bill in the House right now that's being uh, debated this week about maybe not going to an asteroid after all, but going back to the moon. So w without a clear destination, how, do, um, how does that change how these astronauts will be training? Okay. Well, I'll take that question. Um, certainly a lot of their initial training uh, is going to be understanding more about NASA, more about the astronaut corps, learning about the International Space Station, which as I mentioned, uh, is going to be operating for a number of years. Uh, we are looking at a number of different mission concepts. There is an exciting one that we're exploring right now uh, to explore an asteroid uh, first with a robotic mission, which would push the envelope in terms of solar electric propulsion and um, understanding how you might actually capture an asteroid. And then once we would redirect it into an orbit, uh, a stable orbit around the moon, actually send people up uh, on Orion and be able to take samples of that asteroid, which would be a very exciting mission. Um, all of this is really designed to say, how do we learn to live in space uh, beyond low Earth orbit? Um, and how are we developing those capabilities that will eventually take us to Mars? And a lot of those are the same, even if you look at a variety of dis different destinations, anywhere in the you know, Earth-Moon vicinity, um, asteroids and beyond, eventually moons of Mars or Mars. Um, so a lot of the training you, we will do with them uh, will be needed for any of those. And so they've already got a, a training program planned and, and they'll learn about um, systems and spacecraft and, and they'll learn about doing spacewalks and uh, quite a bit of other things um, that will be applicable to many different uh, destinations in space. All right, uh, who is that speaking there? Was that Ellen or Janet? That was Ellen. That was Dr. That was Ellen Ochoa. And I want to, while we have Mike and Kate, I um, wanted to switch a little bit to back to kind of imagining these astronaut candidates, what they're doing and preparing to come to Houston. They're going to arrive, they're going to get a little bit of orientation at Johnson Space Center and, and meet their classmates. But pretty soon, um, pretty quickly off the bat, I think, you go into some special training, including land survival training. Can you both tell us a little bit about what that's like to be meeting new people, getting in this new place, and then you're, you know, jumping right into some real unique training situations? Well, it's a lot of fun, actually. Uh, land survival. We we all undertake land survival training because we fly around the country training in in T thirty eight high performance aircraft that have ejection seats, and we could in extremis have to jump out of that airplane sometime and end up in a harsh environment. So we want to be prepared to be able to survive until we're rescued or, or picked up. So uh, it's a fun, fun time because uh, you're just coming together with your class, you're meeting these people for the first time, and you're getting to experience something like this together. It's, it's, it's a way to kind of bond as a class. And for my class in particular, we, we had a lot of fun doing that. So. Yeah, I remember um, the very first day we actually all met at the badging office of all places and you're sitting in this very pedestrian looking building and you're kind of looking around at all these folks and you're sort of wondering how you even got here in the first place. But second of all, you're looking at these folks and you're saying, you know, I don't know them at all, but in about five, six weeks, they're going to be my best friends and we're going to go through uh, an amazing two years together. And, and these are going to be colleagues really that you're going to have for the rest of your life. So it's a pretty neat time getting to know everybody. And, um, you know, the land survival is... It's got some real practical aspects too. We, um, you know, all of the spacecraft that we're developing are going to land back on Earth at some point in land or water, and so we need the survival training uh, both to get us ready for things like Russian winter survival training as well as water survival training uh, and all the sort of um, demanding training programs that we're going to be asked to do in the future. So it's it's a neat way to bond with the group, and then it's also some really good training that is going to serve you well in your later years. And you've kind of touched on some of those unique training scenarios, but there's really a really broad spectrum of things that you're going to do in that first year and a half or so. Can you each tell us, like, what was the most, what was your most favorite part? 
for me, my favorite training was the spacewalk training. You know, as a kid growing up, wanting to be an astronaut, I uh, one of the things that I always wanted to be able to do as an astronaut was to uh, to do a spacewalk. So I enjoyed the spacewalk training the most, and uh, I know I got some robotic training to operate the robotic arms, but uh, it, it seemed like uh, they didn't give me a whole lot of that training. Maybe maybe uh, you know I just didn't do that well. I don't know what what the problem was. Maybe I didn't push for it hard enough, but uh, but I was uh, fine spending devoting my time uh, uh, developing those spacewalk skills that I actually got to use uh, a few times in space. So uh, that was my favorite training by by far. Um, for mine, I I didn't come from an aviation background. I was a scientific researcher before. So for me, getting a chance to go to Pensacola um, and learn how to fly was the most exciting thing. Um, you know, a lot of folks say, "Well, why are we flying? We don't." fly a winged vehicle anymore and it's not the fact that you're learning how to fly something in space it's the kind of pressure that um, flying in a high performance aircraft puts on you you have to make decisions incredibly quickly you have to learn a huge amount of information about systems and be able to react in milliseconds to an emergency and so practicing that is an incredible model for for flying in space and so that was some of the I think the most intense and then also the most valuable training that I've gotten um, you kind of alluded to the pressure. That's another thing I'm kind of curious about for new arrivals. You know, they're coming to NASA, which is a new culture, um, but also going through this extraordinary training. There's a, a lot of attention on them. Did you feel pressure along those lines of just of just performing, even though you've, you know, all the candidates obviously have been high performers previously? But is that something that you experienced? You know, I think uh, the the type of people that end up becoming astronauts that NASA selects are typically Type A personalities. And, and we all tend to put this pressure on ourselves more than, I don't think it was NASA or the instructors here putting pressure on us. Uh, generally, all of the training is, is taught very well so that uh, it's easily understandable, uh, although it requires some work. Uh, there's no real pressure except that the pressure that you put on yourself, I think, to do well. Yeah, and one of the things that you notice when you when you get to NASA, and particularly when you get to Johnson Space Center, is you meet a huge number of people who are extraordinarily passionate and de dedicated to what they do, and you know that your training is the end result of everything that they're putting into their job, and so there's a there's a pressure to do well for them because you know they've done everything to, from building the mock-up to designing the engineering to designing your training program, and so um, you're you're at the very tip of the spear and you want to make sure that you are doing the best that you can for the space program because it's an incredible honor and a privilege to even be selected. Absolutely. Um, while we have a few minutes left, we're going to try to squeeze in a few more questions both from social media and uh, traditional media. With that, we'll switch back over to the phone bridge for um, a question from Theron Nicholas with KTRH Radio in Houston. Theron, are you Theron. still with Okay, okay, if not, if not we'll switch to Todd Halverson with Florida Today. Hi, Todd Halverson of uh, Florida Today. Um, Mike touched on this a bit, but I was wondering, uh, besides all these folks being type A personalities, I'm wondering if there are other common personality traits in all eight of those selected, and, and for that matter, uh, folks in the astronaut corps. Thanks. Yes, that's mine. Um, I don't know if there's one particular personality trait that's in common to everyone other than everyone has wanted to do this for most of their lives and are very, very excited and passionate about human space flight. Uh, they do all generally have uh, a type personalities. They're very high achievers. Uh, I think the, the quality that probably most of them have is that they don't give up easily. They're very persistent. Uh, which is uh, a very important trait to have when you come here because some of the training is is quite challenging especially the uh, spacewalk training that Mike mentioned that's physically very challenging the aviation training is is challenging for people who've never had a lot of aviation training in the past robotics training can be quite challenging because of the spatial orientation of the of the uh, robotic arm and things like that so there are challenges for everyone once they get here and if you if you're a person that gives up easily well first of all they wouldn't have applied and waited for so long uh, and gotten all the degrees that they got but uh, they they wouldn't make it through the training here so I think that persistence and that determination and that passion are the, are the qualities that we see in almost everyone we select okay now switching back to social media 
um, I believe this one was submitted by Twitter, um, at Kathy R35, who asks, how many times on average did these candidates apply? And I'm not sure, Janet, if you happen to recall that, but I know that traditionally a lot of the current astronauts are people who have reply, um, applied multiple times. So that's that's kind of common. Do you know if that was something in this? Yeah, if, if I recall co correctly, I think three of the candidates that were selected had been interviewed in previous interviews and so were selected on their second or third try. And I believe that there were remaining five candidates who it was all their first time applying and, and being interviewed. I'm not sure about applying, but at least being interviewed. Okay, and one other one from social media. This is from Data Chick, who asks, with commercial flight and other nations starting their own space programs, how has the astronaut role changed recently? Um, well, uh, the the main difference is what I mentioned earlier, that when we flew the, sh the space shuttle, we had a lot of people flying into space every year because we had six to seven people on every space shuttle flight, and we flew five to six times a year. So it was between 30, 35 people a year uh, that flew into space that were mostly Americans. Now that we're flying to the space station on the Soyuz, there's only three seats on each Soyuz. It launches four times a year. And generally, we have one American on, in one of those seats on each Soyuz. So the number of people that fly from, from the United States is, is definitely a lot smaller. Uh, and a lot of times, whenever we have uh, international partners, they take up the second seat whenever... Uh, the United States has more than one seat on the on a Soyuz mission, so it's, it rotates between two and one for Americans or USOS, the United States uh, team, and so it's usually one American and then one international partner and a Russian or two Russians and an American. Okay, and we're going to try to squeeze in one more question before we wrap this up uh, from Marion Kramer on the phone page from space.com. Hi there, thanks for doing this. Um, yeah, I'm actually curious, so what sort of uh, uh, denoted the class size. So I, I guess what I'm really asking is sort of what is the difference between having eight in a class versus having nine? Um, how is that decided? Well, and, you know, that's, it's hard to say that, you know, that we set out looking for eight. We, look, we knew we would need a small number, and again, that's because the size of the office is much smaller now. We just don't need the number of people, people that we needed a few years ago. And so uh, we looked at the attrition rate in the office. We looked at medical attrition as, ver as well as people who are leaving the office voluntarily and going out and, and seeking new careers. Uh, and then at the in very end, um, I think maybe two years ago, I had asked for a range of maybe 10 or 8 to 15, or yeah, up to 15 people, depending on the size of the office, how big it would be today. And we had lost actually more than we thought. So uh, actually, not quite as many as I thought. So the number was smaller than we had uh, intentionally, uh, had intentionally uh, determined it should be. So with the number of flights per year for Americans, and the chief of the astronaut office has gone through and looked at how many opportunities there are for people in the office today. We look at the rate of people leaving, and then we determined that eight should be a sufficient number of people to get us through the next, you know, three to four years before we would have an opportunity to select again, we should maintain that critical number of 45 to 55 people and be able to meet all the manifest requirements for our different programs. All right. Thank you all so very much, and thank you to all the viewers. And uh, we encourage you to follow along on NASA.gov for more updates on this class and other space activities. Thank you.